in the meantime, I can just uh, remember, uh, remind sorry, the, the audience about this lecture series, which is a lecture series about the question of land. Uh, we had already uh, had two lectures, one by Jane Hutton uh, on uh, reciprocal landscapes and another one by uh, Billy Fleming, who talked about designing a Green New Deal. Both lectures are already available in the AA YouTube channel for those of you who didn't, chance, who didn't have the chance to see them. Uh, you can watch them now online. There will be another one uh, lecture on this series uh, next Monday, uh, which will be run by uh, Kai Heron. And, and that lecture is called Averting Capitalist Catastrophism, which is also uh, one that we are looking forward. Um, so perhaps, uh, um, should I start uh, giving the yeah, intro? Yeah, I think so. Yeah? yeah. So uh, while we wait for everyone to, to join, uh, I'm just going to read out the, the basic premise of this lecture, uh, which is uh, called uh, Designing the Half Earth, uh, and will be given by Troy Betes, uh, Philly uh, Mesco, Andrew Pendersen, sorry, Pendergrass. Uh, just a, a number of names that I need to <laughs> learn how to pronounce in different ways. But anyway, uh, the lecture today is asking uh, what kind of political, economic, and social changes are necessary to create a truly environmentally stable society. Uh, in this lecture, uh, Troy, Philip, and Drew will discuss the trade-offs between various environmental policies and emphasize how everything from biodiversity conservation to renewable energy infrastructure is linked to the problem of land scarcity. There is simple, simply not enough land to achieve these environmental goals and maintain high levels of consumption. Uh, Troy, Philip, and Drew will then outline how central planning can efficiently coordinate production within strictly defined limits, such as the amount of land dedicated to food or energy production. Such an economy system is called half-earth socialism. And, and to conclude, they will sketch uh, what daily life might be in such a society. Uh, I just want also to remind, well, not to remind, to tell everybody, everybody that uh, Troy and Drew uh, have written a book on this, and it will be published next year, if I'm correct by Verso, and so, uh, yeah, we're definitely looking forward to uh, this lecture today, which sounds very exciting. Troy Bethesda is a environmental historian uh, and a William Lyon Mackenzie King postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University, and he's currently writing uh, the book I mentioned with Drew Pendergrass titled Half Earth Socialism, uh, which will be published by Verso in 2022. Uh, Philip Mesco is an architect in Estherholm. Uh, he's also a graduate from here at the AA. I, did, I don't know if you want me to tell everybody that you are a graduate from here because you didn't put that in the bio, but I just did that. And he's currently working on the gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country. And also we have a Drew Pendergrass, who is a PhD student in environmental engineering at Harvard University. And his environmental writing has been published in Harper's, The Guardian, and Jacobin magazine. And as I said, with Troy, they're publishing uh, Half Air Socialism. So that's it for me. Uh, and uh, I then let uh, Troy, Drew, and Philip to take over and walk us through what does it mean to design the Half Earth. Thank you very much, guys, and looking forward to the lecture. Thanks, Alfredo, for that introduction. Um very happy to be here. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, so we're going to be doing a bit of an unusual talk, and it's a bit different from what uh, I think we, we ourselves originally imagined. So I was asked to speak about half-earth socialism at the AA, and then I realized that to really to do this properly, um, we I needed to include my collaborators who've been working on this as well. So uh, the first part of the talk is going to be um, my own talk, and that's gonna get into the history and uh, of the problem and the environmental issues behind it. 
Um, and then Drew's going to talk next, and he's going to provide a scientist's perspective on it and really get into how um, uh, planning and uh, modeling theory has developed over the 20th and 21st centuries and how that can help us uh, plan a, a socialist economy that is environmental as well. And then Philip will speak last and he will uh, draw out the implications of this project um, and how it's going to, and how it relates and how it's relevant for architects. So, um, so I, I think it's, it's a, hopefully you'll find this an interesting talk it's just a mix of a, um, you know, it's a collaboration from a humanist, uh, um, an artist and a scientist. And it's been a lot of fun to work with Philip and Drew and we've worked on a book and several articles uh, that we're working on now. And uh, it's been a project that's been quite fun to work on. So I look forward to hear what you have to think uh, about it. So Drew, please slide. So I'm sure some of you have read Plato's Republic and um, there's a, a scene in that book where Socrates is talking to Plato's brother Glaucon and they're sketching their republic. They're, they're trying to figure out what will this um, ideal city look like. And they begin really from the ground up and they decide which are the professions that are gonna be included. And it's, at first it's quite basic. They include just a farmer, a house builder, a cobbler, a weaver. And then Glaucon asks, well, what are we going to be eating? And then, you know, based on those professions, it seems like it's just going to be bread and not much else. And then Glaucon um, complains. And then Socrates relents and says, okay, we will also have um, fruit. We'll have beans. Um, we'll have cheese. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds pretty good, hopefully. And Glaucon again complains and says, hey, what is this? This is fodder for a city of pigs. You know, he really wants some meat. And then Socrates says, fine, if you want some meat, then we'll have to really think about what our city will look like. We'll not only need new professions, but the dimensions of the city will be different as well. So we'll have to get hunters and herders and shepherds and all that. But we also will need a lot more land for, uh, for the pasture for all to feed all these animals. And that will put us perhaps in a conflict with our neighbors, especially if they are also omnivorous and also need land for their flocks and herds. And then he concludes, we have discovered the, the origin of war by thinking through this, this problem of food. And I, I, I start with this, this uh, vignette because I think it shows that um, in classical Greece, it was quite easy for someone to see the connections between ethics and politics, between society and nature, uh, the city and the countryside within one frame quite, quite, quite easily, um, in a way that appears hard for thinkers today to, to replicate. Um, slide. So, for example, um, one of the most uh, prominent contributions to the environmental debate in, in recent years has been the proposal of building many, many nuclear reactors to uh, decarbonize the economy. And I will be discussing this proposal more in depth uh, soon enough. But my, my point is the most debates, especially uh, debates relating to the environment try to solve one part of the environmental crisis and they try to leave the rest of society intact. They try to change as little as possible. So instead of doing what Plato was trying to show, which is really the relationship between all of these, um, all of these spheres of, of life, instead there's an effort to think um, about only one discrete aspect of a problem or leaving everything else intact. Um, and what we're trying to do with, with Hacker Socialism is uh, a more platonic approach, really to try to think about if we start changing um, one part of society has to affect everything else. And what has been especially useful to think through this problem has been the problem of land as it was for, for Plato. So next slide, please. Um, and to really understand why there has been this difficulty to think through the problem of, um, of having a, a large frame to think through environmental, ecological, and economic uh, problems, we can think about uh, what is utopian thought, right? So where this was 
where such analysis was common enough in, in classical Greece, um, you have the emergence of something similar but different in the 16th century, which is the, uh, the appearance of a self-aware utopian tradition. So Thomas More writes Utopia in 1516. And instead of um, you know, directly talking about political affairs, there's this displacement to a, a utopia, right? And so instead of being able to imagine what life will be like, it has to be somewhere else. It has to be, um, or, or perhaps in the future. So as in, uh, it becomes fictionalized in a way. And I think this, this symbolizes this uh, difficulty of thinking about these problems. And again, it's, it's, um, it's emergence in the early 16th century is not a coincidence, I think, because this is also the moment when capitalism begins to emerge as well. And Thomas More is well aware of this, and he talks about the enclosures happening in the countryside. He talks about sheep becoming uh, man-devouring monsters of whole villages and, uh, and churches and, and, and the countryside in general being destroyed by the, this new industry. Um, and for him, again, similar to Plato, he imagines uh, this, this uh, new world, this, this new society, and he is also troubled by um, relations between land and, and, uh, and the economy and between humans and animals, and even has a discussion whether people should eat meat or kill animals or not. So I think there is this, this tradition, but again, it has been, been separated. and and. To some degree, uh, we are trying to revive um, this utopian tradition, which has, it, it itself has been displaced by uh, the Marxist tradition, which seems to want to have more scientific uh, arguments, but scientific, but, but more uh, hard-headed perhaps, or more rational, um, but without this, I, uh, without the possibility of dreaming of what a post-capitalist society will be like. So these are uh, related traditions, um, but also different in each historical epoch. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about four big problems within the environmental crisis. Uh, the environmental crisis is massive. There are many more problems than these four. Uh, these are four important ones. And um, if anything, what I find is that this framework that we're using, which is based on land scarcity, uh, is quite flexible, which I'll uh, develop in a second. So please, next slide. So the first problem that uh, environmentalists talk about that they agree should be solved is the sixth extinction. Um, this is the destruction of up to half of uh, flora and fauna by the end of the century and is called the sixth extinction because it is a, a massive geological event uh, comparable to the last one, which was 66 million years ago when an asteroid hit uh, planet Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. So we are basically doing the same amount of damage in around the same amount of time with capitalism. Um, and this relationship is also based on land. All of these problems I'm going to be talking about are, are based on, on land. So the relationship between biodiversity and land was developed by E.O. Wilson in the 1960s. Um, and Wilson is also the ecologist who came up with uh, the idea of the half earth, which is, which is related to this, this problem and which is, some, which is a concept that we draw on. So the idea is, uh, the amount of land that is destroyed in an ecosystem will tell you how much uh, biodiversity will be left. And this is a relationship with the fourth root. So if half uh, of, a, of an ecosystem is destroyed, then 15% of the species will be lost, leaving 85%. And this is, is half earth scenario. So you lose some species, but not too, too many, still a lot, but not too many. Uh, and the sixth extinction's trajectory is the reverse of this, as in you lose 85% of uh, ecosystems uh, because only 15% are protected. And this means that 50% of species will go extinct. So this is the first problem. Second problem, Drew. Second problem has to do with energy and renewable energy. So again, everyone agrees, you need to decarbonize, uh, so I want to go with nuclear, some want to go with renewables. We personally like renewables. 
Uh, the problem with renewables that people don't talk about often enough is the problem of power density. Power density is the amount of um, the land area's relationship to the amount of energy produced. So this is expressed in watts per square meter. And this means that um, fossil fuels have an extremely high power density. It can be as much as 1,000 or 10,000 watts per square meter. These are energy resources that are uh, very energy dense. They tend to be underground. They don't have much of a footprint above ground. So there are many reasons why it has such a high power density. Renewable energy uh, has a very low power density. It can be as low as less than one uh, watt per square meter uh, for biofuels. And really it peaks at around 20 watts per square meter with concentrated solar power and with uh, most wind or solar coming in between around two or five or 10. So this means that you will need around 10 to 100 times more land for an equivalent energy system. So this is a huge problem. We need land for rewilding, uh, for biodiversity, and we'll need land for um, energy production. Next slide. The third problem uh, has to do with what kind of geoengineering are we going to pursue? How are we going to intentionally change the climate to make uh, life safe, <laughs> safe again during um, during a period of climate emergency? And the two main choices are uh, artificial geoengineering. So this is solar radiation management, where you put aerosols into the atmosphere that will reflect sunlight back into space, uh, cooling down the earth or it will be some kind of natural geoengineering, which is uh, the large scale rewilding of large parts of the earth. I mean, we're talking continental sized areas of like one to three Canada's, huge, huge areas that can sequester um, 800 gigatons of carbon, which uh, is much more than any other kind of uh, carbon sequestration technology available today. So it's one of two choices, um, the safer, uh, one is uh, natural geoengineering, but it takes a huge amount of land. Uh, next slide. Uh, the fourth problem is zoonotic disease. So when I actually, I, I first wrote about Half Earth uh, Socialism, it was in an article uh, over two years ago. And at that point, I only had the first three problems. But since uh, SARS-CoV-2, I decided to add a fourth. And, and again, I think this, uh, Framework is quite flexible. You see, most environmental problems are related to the problems of land, so it's not surprising in a way that zoonotic disease uh, is also uh, can be thought, thought through this lens of after socialism, uh, and that's because zoonotic diseases emerge, um, or they're more likely to emerge the larger the interface between um, humans and, and wild animals, domesticated animals, and wild animals. Uh, and just uh, the general you know, interface between civilization and, and, the, and the wilderness. Um, and then that interface has been growing quite a bit, especially over the last 50 years or so, which is considered a new uh, era um, in the history of disease, where we have many more zoonotic diseases emerging. And the only real solution to this uh, is a land-based one, which means reducing the number of domesticated animals, uh, and also through conservation to use parks as a cordon sanitaire to, to lock in um, pathogens in, in intact ecosystems. So these are the four problems, uh, the four you know, large problems of the environmental crisis. And instead of thinking um, and uh, approaching them piecemeal with uh, an acute solution, we want to um, or our approach is really to think about them together, but this isn't what, what's been done generally. Uh, next slide. So what are the solutions proposed by um, most mainstream environmentalists? What are they like? Next slide. So um, in terms of conservation, again, we, we mentioned E.O. Wilson, uh, who's on the right. And he, he's, he has a bad reputation for being uh, the father of sociobiology, which is definitely a questionable uh, science, if you want to call it that. Uh, it has many critics. And we can talk about more in the Q&A. But he is actually fairly harmless compared to many other conservationists. I mean, he, uh, he generally is a center-left 
environmentalist, um, and he thinks that uh, the environmental crisis can be solved by packing more people into cities and maybe some, um, maybe eating a bit less meat or, and mainly relying on philanthropists like Ted Turner, for instance, to buy up large amounts of land and that will provide the basis for the half earth. But we find this um, pretty pathetic. I don't think uh, this is gonna lead to a large enough area to be protected. Um, and it's not really good for building alliances if you're just relying on a few rich people. And then this leads to a bigger problem with, um, with conservation, which is its reliance not only on uh, philanthropists, but also on colonial regimes uh, and quite racist regimes. Like on the left, we have a picture of Ian Player and his organization, the Wild Foundation, was the first to uh, argue for half the earth to be uh, protected, which was in 2009. And this is a laudable goal, we, we share it. But unfortunately, the Wild Foundation um, was closely associated with the apartheid regime. Uh, Player himself was, was quite racist um, and he had associates uh, who were Rhodesian sympathizers, for instance. Um, and one can also add that another major uh, a node in this network for, for Half Earth is the Wildlands Foundation, which is led by David uh, Dave Foreman. And he is an out and out Malthusian, and he's quite willing to cooperate with the far right uh, over anti immigration and um, argue for pollution, a course of pollution, uh, population control. Um, so this is a very bad uh, legacy. And we think it's also just uh, not a very practical one because the environmental movement needs to be broad, needs to be international, needs to be cross-class if it's ever going to succeed. And instead you have a bunch of racist white guys, which is not ideal. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, the, the next, big solution, as I mentioned before, would be nuclear power. And again, this idea is that if simply we replace um, replace fossil fuels with nuclear, then we don't really need to change anything else. And this is the mainstream environmentalist at some level appealing to, uh, to the status quo uh, elite, uh, the, to the establishment, um, because they're actually making quite a big concession. Nuclear power is pretty much the only issue that can get large numbers of people on the street uh, quite reliably. And you know, nuclear anti-nuclear power proposals uh, frequently win referenda. And there are a few other issues um, in the environmental movement that can really mobilize people. So it's unusual that some of these very important environmental leaders such as James Hansen or George Mombio or James Lovelock or Stuart Brand and the list goes on, uh, actually embrace it. And it's also foolish. And again, I can, I'd be happy to talk about this more in the Q&A and there are many reasons why nuclear power is really not a, a likely option, um, especially because it's, it's very dangerous. A lot of these, uh, pro-nuclear greens really downplay the, the danger associated with nuclear power. And they say things like, oh, no one died in Fukushima or only 50 people died at Chernobyl. Um, but a recent work by the historian Kate Brown, who's um, one of the few people to trawl through the Soviet medical archives, estimates that at least um, around 30 to 50,000 people died in Chernobyl, and probably many more than that. And one should also remember that the disaster Fukushima is ongoing. Um, it almost, I mean, it will, it will probably take another 30 years to clean up uh, and cost around $800 billion. And again, this is, this could have been a lot worse. Um, had uh, TEPCO waited longer before they flooded uh, the reactors, then it could have been a much larger meltdown, which might have forced uh, the evacuation of Tokyo. <laughs> so this is, uh, and the odds of a, a nuclear event of this scope um, is pretty high. It's around 50% with the current level of nuclear reactors um, over the next few decades. And if people like James Hansen get their way, who want to build 150 new reactors a year for the next 35 years to increase the number of reactors tenfold, then probably gonna have a lot more disasters. So next. Um, so the third solution 
I don't know, solution to uh, like one part of the environmental crisis, which ignores its relationship to politics and its relationship to the other aspects of the environmental crisis, is geoengineering. And again, the nuclear, pro-nuclear greens are foolish because they think that by supporting nuclear power, they will get um, uh, the establishment on side. But this uh, ignores that nuclear power is simply too expensive and um, you know, the rich rather not pay for hundreds and hundreds or even trillions of dollars worth of investment when they can simply pay for uh, um, solar radiation management, which would only cost around a billion or two billion a year. I mean, even a single billionaire uh, could easily carry out a, a mission like this. And how this works, as I mentioned before, is that it would send um, either a balloon or um, uh, retrofitted jets into the upper atmosphere to release some kind of aerosol such as sulfur, uh, but there's you know, even diamonds or nano engineer particles uh, that will reflect sunlight back into space. This has many problems. Um, the climatic system is extremely complex. Uh, it could easily disrupt uh, important systems such as the monsoon or the Gulf Stream, which would be quite dangerous. It might even provoke wars if that were to happen. Um, it could damage the ozone layer, which all life depends on. It could also, it would probably bleach the sky white, and it would also reduce the amount of solar radiation hitting the earth, which would affect plant life uh, and crops, uh, but also solar, radi uh, solar panels. So this has many bad effects. It's also uh, quite unpredictable because it is such a complex system. And they've done very little baseline data they have very few models, but they want to get going on this. Um, I should mention that there's quite a bit of political support for this uh, in the United States, especially between both the Republican and, uh, and the Democratic parties. It has been a pet project for neoliberal think tanks for quite some time now. I mean, and, and many neoliberal foot soldiers, such as you know, Bjorn Lomborg or um, the free economics uh, economists at Chicago University. They, they have this, uh, espoused uh, this technology for quite some time because they recognize it as the optimal solution to the environmental crisis. Um, and it's gonna happen quite soon. Like for me, this, I, I would eat my hat if this doesn't happen by 2030. Uh, there's a lot of effort to get this uh, out the door in the next few years, so, but people aren't really talking about it that much. So the next slide. Um, the fourth, like so acute solution to the problem uh, that we discussed earlier, which was do not disease, is to try to predict and model and uh, track the emergence of new diseases as they appear. Uh, there was something called the PREDICT program run by USAID for about 10 years, and they found over a thousand new viruses and other pathogens, including many coronaviruses. But again, this is unlikely to succeed uh, in the long term. There are simply billions of people, you know, trillions of animals, trillions of viruses. Uh, to, it's just so complex to actually uh, react quickly enough to the emergence of new diseases. Um, and we need more than acute solutions. So I'm trying to try to speed up a bit because I'm running low on time. Uh, next. So what are we, what are we uh, espousing? Um, next. So again, all these solutions, they're, they're too focused on a single problem and we want a more platonic uh, approach that again, sees uh, the connections between animals and us and, and nature and society and the economy and the environment and all that. Um, and how do we do that? So the first problem is we have to th think about the problem of energy. Um, it's important to remember that electricity uh, which most people talk about getting 100% uh, non-carbon um, sources for the electrical system is only one small part of the problem. It's only about a, um, a quarter or a fifth of energy produced, as you see in this chart here. Uh, quite a bit of it is in agriculture and deforestation, which is the AFOLU, as agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Much of that is the livestock industry. Um, which is almost as large as uh, electricity, and that needs to be changed quite quite rapidly. Um, and again, transport is not even that large, which again is another focus of discussion. So we see that agriculture is uh, really being underemphasized as a 
a site of uh, carbon emissions and energy use. And, and even industry is quite closely related to this. We industry having a lot of, uh, including a lot of fertilizer production. So, um, but we can begin to think that, okay, we can decarbonize, we can get rid of meat, we can have passive homes. So we can do quite a bit to reduce uh, consumption, but there will be some problems uh, such as making steel, which is quite difficult without fossil fuels and then aviation, which is pretty much impossible without kerosene. But we can talk about more in the Q and A, next slide and try and blitz through this. Um, so I've been talking about land quite a bit. Where do we get this, all this land from for, uh, for half Earth socialism? As you see in this chart, half of all uh, inhabitable land is used for agriculture. Uh, almost four fifths of that is used for uh, livestock. So remember I was saying earlier that we would need, um, you know, one to three Canada's you know, it's just like one to three billion hectares of land. Well, there's four billion hectares uh, of land right in the livestock industry and being used by the livestock industry um, that could be used for rewilding uh, and also for renewable energy. So this is the only large source of land that is not worth very much in terms of GDP um, and it's not necessary for human health. So this is like the only source we can, we can really use. And this is, it's better to use that than to see what we've been seeing more and more in recent years where people are trying to put uh, solar panels in ecologically sensitive areas or areas that are important for indigenous people, uh, which is not the route to take. But again, uh, this is an example of the problem of land scarcity and we have to be conscious of it and decide which land to use for what. Next slide. Um, so because of power density being a problem for renewables, that means that uh, for some countries that are densely populated, that use a lot of energy, let's say Germany or the UK, all of the country would have to be covered in turbines and biofuel plantations if it were to go uh, totally renewable. Um, that's clearly impossible. One way to get down to a reasonable level is to reduce energy consumption. So this is a chart here. It's quite out of date. I apologize for that. But the general relationship is more or less the same, where you have a couple of rich countries, like Canada, the US, which use around actually 12,000 watts per person. Western Europe is around four to 6,000 per person. And then you also poor countries, which are around 1,000 or so. And the idea is um, proposed by the 2,000 Watt Society, which comes from a uh, University in Switzerland to have a convergence at 2000 watts around the world. So everyone's using the same amount of energy. And that would allow even a densely populated country like the UK to have only a third of its land used for energy production. And that means half of its land could be used for uh, wilderness and the rest for agriculture and cities and so forth. So this is possible everywhere, which is what we're trying to show. Next. Um, I've been talking a lot about trade-offs between different uh, energy, um, in between, between different land uses. I mean, and this is generally the, the framework that we're using, but there are some overlaps. There are some synergies that one can exploit. And, and that mainly has to do with the amount uh, that, that land uh, that is, or ecosystems that are biodiverse, um, that have, the space for migrating, large migrating herbivores that have apex predators, uh, they sequester a lot more carbon than uh, tree monocultures. <laughs> so uh, the goals that we had before, which are you know, uh, keeping zoonotic disease uh, locked up and having um, and preventing the sixth extinction and sequestering carbon naturally, these are actually uh, mutually reinforcing goals. And I can talk more about the relationship between predators and uh, carbon sequestration in the Q and A. An example of the sea otter and the kelp forest in British Columbia is a good example, uh, but we don't have time for that. So, next. Um, and I think one way to uh, really imagine the potential for a sort of planetary Plato as in to really imagine the, the connections between the world, uh, between um, the economy, ecology, uh, and so forth, is to remember that there has already been a gigantic planetary rewilding before. And this happened during the Little Ice Age, uh, after the New World um, 
had been you know, discovered, if you want to put it that way, by Europeans in the late 15th century. There was a, an immediate transfer of zoonotic disease from Europe uh, to the New World, which wiped out millions of people. There were around 50 to 100 million people living in the New World, uh, which is not far off the 60 million living in Europe. Around 90 to 95% of these people died um, rather quickly from all these disease on top of war and slavery and genocide and so forth. But that allowed, uh, this mass death allowed all this rewilding to happen in areas that had formerly, formerly been cultivated, which was enough to cool the earth uh, by a degree, which would lead to scenes like this where the Thames would freeze about once a decade. Um, and we have to imagine what would a socialist, democratic, and hopefully bloodless uh, second little ice age look like. And this is again, just imagine the scale and the speed at which this, this could happen. And also to remember that capitalism has been changing the climate for centuries, not just recently. Next slide. Uh, I want to get very, to enter very briefly into uh, the philosophical debate of what socialism is. I'm going to try and do this in two minutes. Uh, next. <laughs> so, um, we are, our project is inspired in many ways by neoliberalism. Uh, this is because the neoliberal critique of socialism is quite a powerful one. Um, and, it, and also because we are inspired by Hayek and other neoliberals attempt to renovate their ideology after the failures of um, World War I, the rise of the welfare state and the Great Depression in, uh, in the 1930s. They completely changed their ideas and that has not happened generally on the left since the collapse of Soviet communism um, in the early 90s. And we think there's a need to go back to first principles. Um, and Hayek asked a useful question, which is uh, a question of knowledge, what can be known and what can be known uh, can be political and what can't be known is outside the realm of politics. But he puts the veil of ignorance over the market. The market is this unknowable uh, sphere and therefore um, must be protected. And if anything is seen as almost like this mystical object. Um, and then we instead try to out Hayek Hayek by saying nature is much more complex than the economy. And we put the veil of ignorance over, over nature. And this means that because we cannot fully know nature, which I think geoengineering, zoonotic disease and many other examples make manifest, um, we have to then leave that out of our control by rewilding and leaving uh, the biosphere as intact as possible, which is why we believe in the half earth. Uh, and that means that what can be known uh, and must, must be limited and controlled is the economy. Um, next slide. And the socialist theorist who really thought most about this is Otto Neurath, who was uh, Mises and Hayek's opponent in the 20s and 30s, and actually was the one that was really uh, sparked the socialist calculation debate, in which was the crucible for neoliberal thought itself. And uh, Neurath argued that socialism must be the conscious control of the economy and the direct seeing, the direct visibility, almost in a platonic way, of what is in the economy. And that means instead of using a universal equivalent like money, instead we must deal with things in themselves, such as you know hectares of land or watts of energy. And he called these natural units. And to make the economy visible to the working class, he developed a whole uh, uh, language and graphic design called isotype, as you see here, and developed exhibitions to allow the working class to see and imagine uh, the economy much the way that Plato was trying to do in his Republic and therefore make socialism possible. And, but how do we do this? Drew, tell us. Uh, thanks, Trey. So, For Leonid Kantorovich, mathematics was a matter of life and death. With the threat of bombardment by the Luftwaffe looming overhead, the mathematician paced the frozen expanse of Lake Lagoda and inspected a caravan of precisely weighted trucks trundling over the ice. During World War II, German and Finnish armies surrounded Kantorovich's hometown of Leningrad and laid siege. The only path to Soviet supply lines lay across the frozen lake over a path known as the Road of Life. That's what's shown right here. Kantorovich's job was to minimize the losses of supply trucks, which often fell through the treacherous ice using his mathematical know-how. 
His efforts brought thousands of tons of fuel and food into the city, sustaining the siege and allowing a million civilians to be evacuated. So this is Leonid Kotarovich. Uh, he was a mathematical prodigy. So when he was uh, developing his theories, he actually did look like this. When he was not busy calculating the margins of life and death at Lake Lagoda, Kantorovich was hard at work on his masterpiece, The Best Use of Economic Resources, a book as practical as The Road of Life. The work offered an alternative to the nepotistic and often inefficient decisions made by the Soviet Central Planning Board. Kantorovich imagined that algorithms could increase efficiency at every scale from a single factory to the entire country. Just as he had optimized the convoys across the icy lake, the young mathematician believed it would be possible to optimize socialism itself. The unlikely birthplace of his dream of red plenty was a plywood factory. Kantorovich met with engineers from Leningrad's Plywood Trust in 1938, shortly before the war, to discuss what appeared at first glance to be a simple problem, how to optimize production on eight lathes, producing five different types of plywood, all with varying levels of efficiency. Initially, Kantorovich thought this would be easy, but he soon realized that if he were to use traditional methods of optimization, he would need to solve around 1 million equations, completely impractical. Soon he devised an extraordinarily efficient technique called linear programming, which allowed him to work out the optimal factory arrangement in an afternoon or so using only pen and paper. Some of you might've come across linear programming if you're in applied math. What's more, the algorithm could be universally applied to any situation where a particular value had to be maximized or minimized. Already with the primitive computers available in the 1940s, Kantorovich could dream of programming the USSR. The stream unfortunately never came true. It failed due to some historical contingencies of the Eastern Bloc, which we might be able to talk about in the Q&A, but also because of deeper, more structural impediments. The lack of democracy in the Soviet Union meant that it was impossible to create a new political coalition strong enough to overcome the vested interests thwarting Kantorovich's reforms. The economic class, the class of economic planners and managers who enforced the Communist Party's series of five-year plans stubbornly held onto their power and faced little pressure to relent perpetuating a sclerotic economic system. So over the next few minutes, I will think aloud with you about how a democratically planned economy might be organized in an age of ecological collapse. How will we make half Earth socialism work? My approach is not strictly analytical, like how a neoclassical economist might lay out axioms of human behavior and then derive the economy from first principles. This has been done on the left before, uh, most notably by Oscar Longo and Albert Lerner's model of market socialism. That's part of the socialist calculation debate that Troy mentioned just now. While that deductive approach can be powerful, today I come to you as what Claude Lévi-Strauss calls the bricolure. The bricolure cobbles together pre-existing fragments of experience and knowledge to create something new. So Leonid Kutorovich for me is one figure from the past who comes alive when I think about eco-socialism, but he is hardly the only one. I'll place him alongside other ideas and figures from both the present and the past and hope that out of this bricolage will come a new vision for how we might plan the future. So let's return to Leonid Kantorovich. I'm not interested in Kantorovich because I think linear programming is a sufficient method to plan an economy because it simply isn't. I'm interested in it because linear programming offered what was perhaps the first practical method to institute a moneyless economy in a modern society. Rather than reducing everything to a universal equivalent, like a price, Kantorovich could balance competing restrictions in their natural units, like tons of steel and concrete, hours of labor, kilograms of carbon, across many different projects simultaneously. It's sort of like a mathematical way of doing what Plato was trying to do. Here is the promise of an entire nation or planet using its resources efficiently and sustainably, something that would be impossible to achieve either with small autarkic little communes or a profit-driven capitalist globe. In our forthcoming book, we actually take numbers on all sorts of planetary boundaries like carbon emissions, land use, et cetera, and compute energy and agricultural scenarios that meet both the needs of all the Earth's inhabitants, supplying them with the 2000 watts and uh, enough food to eat without destabilizing the climate and the biosphere. So it's important to note that this is actually not impractical. So moneyless indeterminate plan planning was the dream of Otto Neurath, who Troy just mentioned. While Neurath never figured out how to make this work in practice, Kantorovich's linear programming offered a vision of how indeterminate planning could be possible. His method requires planners to engage in the very Neurathian practice of laying out goals and constraints in physical units, generating different plans that could be chosen democratically. You can imagine that blueprints for the future could be put to people in a referendum or to a parliament or something where you have the entire economy kind of in view and not just voting on um, you know, uh, the, the sphere of politics, but actually the sphere of economics. So, however, as I hinted before, a handful of offices doing some linear programming will not be sufficient to plan a real economy. 
So this building, the Central uh, Economic Mathematical Institute in Novosibirsk, Siberia, was where uh, uh, Kantorovich spent a lot of his career. I bring it up because uh, it might be interesting for the architects here because uh, sort of a wacky building with uh, floors designed uh, exclusively for computers and uh, there's a Mobius strip on the front. It's a fun little weird little <laughs> building. Um, so the world is a complicated place and coordination needs to happen on all levels at once. So how do we deal with emergencies or sudden changes to our well-laid plans? For some technical reasons that I don't have time to delve into here, Kentorovich's linear programming method is not very good at this sort of contingent planning. So we need another mid-century idea uh, revived, cybernetics. So the term cybernetics comes from the Greek Kubernetes or steersman and originates like linear programming during World War II. The heart of cybernetics is the problem of controlling systems characterized by a phenomenon called feedback. In complex systems, like a half-earth socialist global plan, the actions taken by people to control one part of the system will feed back and have their effect on other parts of the system. For example, fully electrifying public transit may reduce the need for biofuels and increase the need for solar panels and energy storage, which will free up land for rewilding because biofuels are the most inefficient source of fuel, but increase the need for solar panels and uh, uh, put pressure on the grid. So we have these changes that affect everything. The original cybernetic system and anti-aircraft predictor was a calculating device that would take into account the defensive zigzag paths of, energy, of enemy planes and help flat gunners line up their shots during the blitz. So in the Soviet Union, cybernetics was intimately tied up with the military. Reformers wanted to rebuild the Soviet economy on cybernetic terms and they wanted a disciplined controlled system like that anti-aircraft predictor I just mentioned, with little room for local variation or dissent. Kantorovich, on the other hand, and economists like him, they wanted a more decentralized vision. They wanted firms independently using the parameters from linear programming algorithms to plan their production. So one uh, figure in Novosibirsk, Siberia, where all these debates about cybernetics and economics were raging in the 1950s and 60s in the USSR, summed up the disagreement in mathematical terms. Economists Economists like Kantorovich advocated for the theory of mathematical optimization, so that includes linear programming, whereas the military-influenced cyberneticians were opting for the theory of mathematical control. So control theory is a branch of mathematics central to cybernetics. It basically involves choosing parameters to control the behavior of a complex system of usually differential equations. So think making slight changes to the trajectory of a nuclear missile. This is a cybernetics problem par excellence. So sort of a terrifying origin story for cybernetics. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not clear how Kantorovich's method could be updated in real time as information flows in from the real world. So to solve this problem, we would like to use uh, both sort of the decentralized vision of Kantorovich's optimization with the kind of uh, ability to adapt to changing circumstances of the cyberneticians control theory. But the Soviet control theorists are too rigid for this task. Like we would like our control system to allow for local variation as Kantorovich envisioned and not create a dystopian military hierarchy. So democracy, like I mentioned earlier, is essential to building a planning system that serves the people, not a bureaucratic caste. So this is where we need to turn to another planning theorist and cybernetician, Stafford Beer. So here's Stafford Beer with his famous beard. Unlike the Soviet cyberneticians, Stafford Beer wanted to create an egalitarian and democratic control system. He believed that the complex systems of the modern world could be controlled, even something as complicated as the economy, so long as the controller itself was complex enough to fairly represent the system. And cybernetics is called the law of requisite variety. Acting on this intuition in the early 1970s, he developed a five-part loosely hierarchical management architecture called the viable systems model. The bottom three levels of this model respond to day-to-day -day issues in all parts of a complex systems, while the top two levels intervened in emergencies and devised long-term goals. Most, most importantly for us, his model exemplifies the promise of using control theory to organize an economy, but without relying exclusively on Kantorovich's preferred method of optimization or falling into the Soviet cyberneticians' tendency towards rigidity. Beer was a quite, um, while a socialist, uh, quite uh, critical of the USSR. Moreover, unlike Kantorovich, Beer actually got to put his ideas into practice in a real national economy. So that's what's happening right here. Beer's immortality in the history of socialism lies in his ill-fated utopian project Cybersyn in 1970s Chile. Perhaps the closest historical analog to our project, Cybersyn was a computer system designed to manage the state-owned industries as part of Salvador Allende's peaceful transition to socialism. The viable systems model was a natural choice for the fiendishly complex problem of managing day-to-day -day operations for hundreds of factories and mines, as well as plans for long-term development. 
like Kantorovich is meeting with the plywood engineers. This was a moment in history where technical theory and reality mesh together so tightly they can't be separated. In practice, Cyberson had some failures, particularly in the neoclassical assumptions it used to model the economy, which turned out to be unable to model an economy in crisis. And we don't have time to delve in those now, but we can talk in the Q&A. But Beer never had a chance to improve on Cyberson's design because soon the program would come to an abrupt and bloody end. Military junta overthrew the elected government on September 11th, 1973 with American support and installed a neoliberal dictator, Augusto Pinochet, whose administration was staffed by University of Chicago economists. You know, our friend Hayek has come back. Allende has no, had no road of life to weather the fascist siege of his presidential palace and shot himself to evade capture and Beer was lucky to escape with his life. So as we continue to think about our half earth planning, let's look to one final experiment in historical planning that sought to combine decentralized control within a total plan, which is something that Beer achieved with his viable systems model, with explicit protection of the environment. Olga Bermatova, who was a young cybernetician in Novosibirsk in the 1980s, sought to reform economic planning so that it could account for the need to protect Lake Baikal in Siberia, pictured here with methane bubbles frozen in the lake. Uh, Lake Baikal is by far the world's largest and deepest freshwater body, complete with its own species of freshwater seal. Late Soviet mega projects threatened this unique ecosystem, and Bermatova criticized existing Soviet planning for failing to understand the consequences. Like most kinds of planning inspired by control theory, Bermatova's, Bermatova's environmental model required an enormous amount of continually updating data a challenge she recognized. As historian Diana kirkovsky West surmises, quote, Bermatova believed that the answer to resource depletion laid in a system of continual information feedback performed in real time in the future world of a fully computerized command economy. If the cybernetic system lacks this data, this level of data throughput, environmental issues will just go unrecognized or uncorrected. However, the Soviet Union lacked the kinds of data dense networks required for environmental planning that Olga Bermatova had envisioned. And this really frustrated her. She argued that the quote, current informational systems of activities for environmental protection are inadequate. That was about as harsh as she could get. Now in the age of satellites and ubiquitous environmental sensors, climate and weather models have access to information that Bermatova could only dream of. In fact, I wanna argue that it's no coincidence that modern environmental scientists have solved Bermatova's information problem. And in the process have created global environmental models that we rely on today. Indeed, the Soviet Union was a crucial node in the development of global climate science. Many Soviet scientists gave up on building models of the economy after years of bureaucratic resistance and instead attempted to intervene in politics through a less risky channel, which is models of the planet's biosphere and climate. In 1977, the Computer Center in Novosibirsk launched a program to build what is now called an Earth System Model, an enormous computer simulation that emulates the physics and chemistry of the entire planet, predicting everything from weather and climate to air quality and environmental health. So I'm showing here the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey in the US. Um, this is where the first Earth System model was developed. Um, I've actually worked here in the basement. Uh, so in 1982, the Soviet ESM allowed scientists to safely intervene in political debates without provoking a backlash from elites. For example, the 1980s controversy over the possibility of nuclear winter was sparked by ESMs, modeling the climate of a post-nuclear war, forever changing the politics of atomic weapons. So if the Soviets themselves worked on Earth system models to obliquely discuss the politics of nuclear war and environmental degradation, it is worth considering that this scientific field is the proper inheritor of the lost art of economic planning. Beer's structure of a central office updated by a wide network of mostly independent local data sources has a long history in climate science. Climate science and meteorology were the first fields that collected and processed global data in real time to make even a banal statement like the world has warmed by one degree since 1850. Scientists need to compile data from a vast network of ground observation sites, weather balloons, research vessels, satellites, feed the data into enormous physical and mathematical models to form a coherent world picture. So this is one of the supercomputers that uh, ESMs are run on today, the NASA Discover Cluster. I use this in my day job. So what do ESMs have to tell us about controlling a large complex system, like an economy plan to serve people's needs while still respecting planetary boundaries? As Kantorovich noted in his vision of multi-level linear programming, a planned society needs a way to balance an overarching national or global vision with sensitivity to local conditions. But atmospheric scientists have developed a whole scientific framework for doing just that. Using supercomputers, scientists run models of the entire world at coarse, revolution, uh, coarse resolution, overlooking some of the small scale dynamics in nature that are infeasible to include in such a huge simulation. So local scientists then use those large models to shape their base assumptions of how a smaller spatial region, like a continent, a nation, or a city might work. 
and then run their own more detailed model on that region. So that system, which is called downscaling or nested simulations, uh, kind of recalls the viable systems model where there are interconnected and hierarchical modules that govern at different levels of complexity. A computer run economic plan will also need to rapidly respond to catastrophes, correct scientific and social assumptions that they turn out to be wrong and adapt to a changing world. As it turns out, Climate scientists and meteorologists have also figured out a way to update their models with new information, having developed an extraordinary powerful algorithms in a field known as data assimilation. So data assimilation is something that you're very familiar with, even if you haven't heard the term, because weather is a complex and chaotic system, because even a model with perfect physics will quickly spin away from reality due to the famous butterfly effect. So as a result, weather models are constantly corrected by a global, uh, global data network to correct for all this chaos. When you check the weather in the morning, you are tapping into knowledge produced by a global network of supercomputers and observing instruments, and unknowingly experience the sort of data a half-earth socialist might access as they plan their work. So if you're an American, this satellite on the left goes, you are interacting with every day when you check the weather. It's correcting these models constantly. So I wanna close my, uh, my part of the talk with this quote from Kantorovich's 1975 Nobel Prize acceptance speech, which captures this whole problem that we've been talking about. The problem is to construct a system of information, accounting, economic indices, and stimuli, which permit local decision-making organs to evaluate the advantage of their decisions from the point of view of the whole economy. That's Kent Torvich. The goal of half-worth socialism isn't to build some top-down ecological dictatorship. It's to create systems of information and feedback that allow free people around the world to make decisions that simultaneously respond to their situation, while also considering the needs of the planet. So it's empowering local decision-making organs to evaluate their decisions from the point of view of the whole world. It's sort of like Plato in practice. So creating a just world that fits within planetary boundaries is the road of life that humanity must cross in the 21st century. During the siege, Kantorovich understood that if trucks were loaded too heavily, they would crash through the ice. But if they were loaded too lightly, then the people of Leningrad would starve. So half earth socialism requires a similar balancing act. We need to supply everyone with the material foundations of the good life, sustenance, shelter, education, art, healthcare, while preventing human interference from in the lithosphere and biosphere from approaching unstable levels. So I'll pass it on to Philip to talk about what this means for architecture. Thanks, Drew. Uh, so next slide, please. So, no, the previous one. <laughs> uh, so if what has just been expounded presents a new stab at the at planning in the face of ecological collapse, then surely architects would also have to rise to the task, given their historical role as planners. While the consequences of our disciplines are many, for example, what will forestry look like and how will it affect building in wood, um, or how will buildings deal with lower energy quotas, I will decide, uh, I will dedicate this brief uh, appendix to a problem which has been at the center of modern urban town, uh, town planning um, since the 19th century, which is the division between town and country. Next slide. Uh, so this problem featured in socialist debates almost from the, the beginning, uh, the emergence of socialism, um, owing to the horrible blight on workers in the rapidly expanding towns in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. And Marx and Engels, uh, communists uh, par excellence, if you wish, uh, wanted to abolish the distinction altogether. They saw in this uh, the, the, both the physical conditions of the working class, but also the emergence of a social division of labor. Next slide. Um, so one of the 10 demands in the Manifesto of the Communist Party of 1848, for example, thus read, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of all the distinction between town and country by a more equ equable distribution of the populace over the country. And next slide. Even in 1872, so almost 25 years later, Engels would write in the house in question, uh, quote, the housing question can only be solved when society has been sufficiently transformed for a start to be made towards abolishing the antithesis between town and country, which has been brought to, the, to an extreme point by present day capitalist society. Far from being able to abolish this antithesis, capitalist society on the contrary is compelled to intensify it day by day, end quote. Um, and statements such as these uh, were built on the conceptual and historical insight that Marx and Engels had into the origin of capitalism or so-called primitive accumulation. Next slide. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, thinkers such as Robert Branner and Ellen Mikesons Wood expanded on Marx's account of 16th century England to show that in many ways, capitalism emerged in the countryside, although this is a debate still ongoing. 
this happened through a process of uh, the enclosure of common, la common land or turning farmland to pasture, et cetera, like uh, Troy was talking about with Thomas More, which created an essential precondition for capitalism, the proletariat, a class that was free in the double sense, that is, individuals free from peonage or slavery, but also free from any means of subsistence and means of production. In order to survive and reproduce their condition, they had no choice but to sell their labor power on the market. And back to the 19th century, uh, especially after the steam engine had liberated the factory from water power, uh, enabling them to gather in, in cities where labor was more easily controlled, for example, uh, workers crammed into appalling slums in great numbers. Next slide. Uh, at the same time, the, the planning of the city uh, was shedding its kind of baroque skin of uh, you know, visual planning, um, instead taking on the task of functionally planning society as such. By the end of the 19th century, anarchist writers like Peter Kropotkin and bourgeois reformists alike uh, inspired Ebenezer Howard to invent, as he called it, the Garden City, one of the most important schemes in the history of modern town planning. In his book, Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform, Howard sought to combine the best of the town and the best of the countryside, as he saw it. So on the left, you can see his three magnets, uh, classic image. Uh, he imagined the network of cities that, upon reaching their set limits, multiplied rather than grew, ensuring proximity to nature while enjoying the benefits of cooperative labor and collective amenities. Next slide. Uh, while Howard did his best to appeal to hard-nosed Victorian businessmen to finance the endeavor, and much of his book is really about money, he was quickly left behind by a movement that had rapidly outgrown him. The Garden City soon became the Garden Suburb, tailored among, August, among other things to encourage home ownership in the face of the Bolshevik threat in the wake of the First World War and the Russian Revolution. Um, next slide. Uh, so explicitly there were uh, debates in, in Britain at the time that they were guarding against Bolshevism by uh, investing in uh, you know, uh, detached housing, et cetera. Next slide. Um, I won't read his quote, but they're, they're talking about uh, that the difference between town, town and country has been effaced by the suburb and now it's all neutrality. Next slide. Trying to rush this now. Next, please. Um, so despite major attempts to engage with the town country divide over the course of the 20th century, which I don't have time to get into here, and I can just mention, for example, the a very interesting exchange between Le Corbusier and Moise Ginsberg uh, in the 20s and 30s, um, the suburb became hegemonic, uh, as I think we're all aware of today. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, well, we jumped ahead now. Uh, but this did not mean that the distinction has been overcome. Indeed, today, in the face of climate disaster, it has returned in full force. Now, however, the conditions have changed. So in light of the half earth, it is clear that the dynamics of town and country will have to be played out within a drastically limited realm, one opposed to a third term, wilderness, as we have seen. Uh, while we recognize the dangers of such a dichotomy, uh, we believe that it is analytically useful because it helps us see the problem clearly. Next slide. So if we return to the problem today, um, whereas in Howard's day it was the city that was in question, today it seems to be beyond reproach. A decade after Mustar City uh, and its fiascos, the so-called Echo City is very much alive today. Uh, last year, Big won a master plan competition for an extension of Penang in Malaysia uh, with a proposal termed Biodiver City, which really says it all and right there in the name, right? Uh, while Engels, uh, Berk Engels presented the holy trinity of ecological, social, and economic sustainability, it is clear even from these images that this is the same old city veneered in automation and dipped in green. Next slide. Uh, refusing to put into question any of these parameters, it is perhaps not surprising that Engels' re recent turn to the planetary scale encountered the same problem. Next slide. So in a recent lecture at GSAP uh, last year, uh, he, uh, next slide. He went from master plan to master planet. Next slide. Uh, having turned the blue, pale blue dot, um, uh, having turned to the pale blue dot only after a stint of uh, terraforming Mars, uh, Big's master planet uh, regards the present environmental predicaments as a mere matter of engineering. Thus, while he actually considers parameters such as power density, uh, Ingalls nevertheless envisions a planet on which everyone will enjoy the living standards of Singapore uh, with the concomitant energy consumption. Um, so he poses a much more ambitious problem uh, where we want to kind of limit uh, electricity consumption. He wants to um, really accelerate it. 
So perhaps this Earth is premised on mining colonies on Mars, <laughs> as you can perhaps tell from this image. Next slide, please. And Biggs is not the only attempt at planning the planet. Uh, MVRDV and co-founder Winnie Maas, uh, so-called think tank, the Y Factory, have imagined, among other things, a green world in which every idiosyncrasy has succumbed to the isometric logic of the city as forest, as you can see in this image. Like there's no mountains left, there's no desert. Everything is a green network. Um, and uh, someone like Lorger would be astonished by this, I think. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and in their ostensible despise for quote unquote greenwashing, the Y factory given to liberal technocratic fantasies of rational neutrality, which prompt them to strive to quote outsmart and quote beat nature. And I'll just read this quote because it's so outlandish. Politicians and developers misuse ecology to promote their own agendas. Greenwashing has become the state of the art marketing tool. Who can we trust? What we need to proceed effectively is a neutral rational tool that can balance and validate vague assumptions about green. Can we invent a calculator for green that exposes our dilemmas and judge our efforts? That brings about a new aesthetics linked to a more advanced understanding of nature. That could even beat nature, uh, end quote. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. These lush visions are as far removed from nature as anything, and they echo the pro-nuclear greens attempt at fixing the problem in isolation, as we've seen previously. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is, is another proposal, like a, it's being built uh, right now in Amsterdam by MVRDV, kind of showing that they really don't question the, uh, the preconditions of the city at all. Next slide, please. Um, in the midst of this, uh, Rem Kolas, the paradigmatic urban thinker, uh, recently opened his exhibition, Countryside, the Future, concluding nearly a decade of research on, uh, quote, the other 98% of the Earth's uh, surface, end quote. Filling the Guggenheim, New York with a myriad of rural trivia, the exhibition betrays Colas' journalistic past. In his typical deadpan manner, Colas seems to be interested only in the next scoop. Next slide, please. Uh, so I quote from the, the exhibition brochure or the book uh, that they produced together with this exhibition. Quote, what we wanted to collect is evidence of new thinking, new ways of paying, new ways of cultivating, new ways of building, new ways of remembering, new ways of exploring, new ways of acting, old ways of contemplating and being, and I don't know if you're referencing Heidegger here, new ways of using new media, new ways of owning, renting, new ways of protecting, new ways of planting, new ways of farming, new ways of fusing, new ways of harvesting that are taking place beyond a metropolitan consciousness and that ultimately could make it possible that we all don't end up unhappily huddled together in cities and would enable us to experience a realm that we have ignored at our and its peril, a base from which to make the world a better place, end quote. Next slide, please. Taking countryside more seriously is uh, Sébastien Marron, uh, who considers this exhibition taking the countryside as, quote, a transatlantic footnote, footnote to Colas, uh, end quote. Focusing on the question of architecture and agriculture, Marot likewise presents a panoply of references culminating in four possible future scenarios, of which this is the first, called incorporation, in which the highly capitalistic metropolis absorbs agriculture. Next. Uh, negotiation, in which agriculture becomes an integral component of urban extensions. Next slide, please. Infiltration, in which agriculture and horticulture invade the city. Next slide. And finally, secession, in which people form autonomous permaculture communes dispersed across the land. It is clear from the, the book that Marot prefers the latter, uh, and the project can be read as a subtle manifesto for a kind of deliberate agricultural practice, if you will. Next slide. Uh, the complete opposite of this is the last and most recent examples of our brief survey, uh, which is Liam Young's uh, Planet City uh, from this year, actually. Um, a uh, a quote, fiction shaped like a city, end quote, in which the projected terrestrial population of 10 billion people relocate to one single city, covering the size of an average American state, leaving the rest of the planet to rewild. While scarce in detail, uh, this city is supposedly self-sufficient, zero waste, and built from recycled material. Next slide. Termed, quote, widely provocative <laughs> by Young himself, the project is supposed to highlight the absurdities of our current urban condition rather than present a plausible executable proposal. But it is hard to see uh, the point of the supposedly green version of Kowloon Walled City, where pink light illuminates the seemingly endless night. Uh, and 
we think kind of, I mean, we applaud Morocco's agriculture um, and autonomy, and we kind of, in a way, applaud a young, ostensible rewilding, and you never see it in, in these images and in the movie. Uh, it's, it's supposedly only there. But we think that they kind of shoot past each other somehow. And as the formal opposites of town and country remain locked in a struggle, as we have seen, uh, it is astonishing that the proletarian condition at the center of the divide is almost totally neglected. So only focusing on this kind of physical, tangible uh, distinction. Uh, but perhaps it is here that the path forward lies. Capitalism is a mighty beast and the present task of half our socialism is indeed daunting, but striking at the vital organs might deal a deadly blow. As we have seen, agriculture lies at the heart of both the question of land and the proletariat. A so-called return to the land while not total and immediate, would constitute both the precondition and the result of socialism. But this by no way uh, implies a return to feudalism. Even as we abandon the dream turned nightmare of controlling nature, we have better ways of controlling the economy. And as Rob Lucas and John Clegg has recently observed, uh, quote, growing the food we need to live, the prototype of all instrumental activity, could become not just a means to an end, but an end in itself and therefore no longer something that has to be imposed on anyone with threats of excommunication from the human community. The free production of one's own existence, unfettered by relations of exploitation or domination, would be the experience of a kind of freedom that has been almost entirely lost to humanity in the capitalist epoch." Uh, end quote. Next slide, please. So rather than indulging in lukewarm fiction, we find it more interesting to study actual examples an economic system resembling half our socialism can actually be found in recent history. Cuba's periodo especial, uh, pardon my pronunciation. In, the 19, in 1990, the Soviet Union stopped subsidizing petroleum imports to its socialist allies. And with little hard currency to buy it on the world market, Cuba had to decarbonize almost overnight. At the time, Cuba's model of industrial cash crop production left it more reliant on fossil fuel inputs than even U.S. agriculture. Getting by without petroleum or petroleum-based products, that is fertilizers or pesticides, forced um, a compressed and large-scale experiment in organic agriculture. Soon there were 26,000 public gardens in Havana alone, allowing the city to produce half of its nutritional needs itself. The government bought a million bikes from China to replace the idle buses and cars. Not only did thousands of Cubans become, more, uh, become urban gardeners, but many others returned to the land to help alleviate the greater labor demand of a decarbonized agricultural system. With them went more educational and cultural facilities to further help bridge the town and country divide. Plantation monocultures could not be managed without massive fossil fuel inputs, so Cubans cultivated less land more intensively, returning about a third of farmland to wilderness. This has helped Cuba maintain its incredible biodiversity. It is listed among uh, Wilson, E. Wilson's Global Hotspots, for example, and it has led the World Wildlife Fund to recognize it as the world's only sustainable, quote unquote, country. Of the agricultural land that remained, little could be dedicated to wasteful animal husbandry, leading to people eating less meat and more vegetables. This dietary shift combined with peddling or walking to work ensured that the Cuban population became healthier despite the crisis, uh, except for some uh, flaws that we can talk about um, in the Q&A. Impressively, the infant mortality rate continued to fall during this special period, which demonstrated the durability of the country's health and food systems. To be sure, the 1990s were not an easy natural transition for, to a post-carbon and biodiverse society. But if this poor, isolated island could refashion itself during a severe economic recession into a novel form of sustainable socialism, then no society has an excuse, excuse for inaction. Of course, wishing the world to go through the initial hardships of the special period is no utopian project. Just as we asked of the Little Ice Age, what does a utopian and democratic special period look like? While Cuban planners exhibited greater creativity and tenacity than the Chilean cyberneticians uh, that Drew talked about had done in the 1970s, they would nevertheless have benefited from the techniques developed by Kantorovich, Beer, and Burmatova. Cuban democracy is too restricted for a truly free society. Cuba's energy system has made only limited strides to renewable sources, such as wind and solar. One hopes that other countries will not have to go through such a wrenching transition without solidarity and support from other countries. Half our socialism is a utopian creed to imagine and work for a future after capitalism. It might seem contradictory, then, that we have relied on so many 20th century ideas, from linear programming to isotype. Yet, in some ways, this should not be so surprising. 
Hayek reimagined liberalism in the aftermath of World War I and the Great Depression, changing an emphasis from the enlightened individual who navigated a world through contracts to an omniscient market that overshadowed an ignorant humanity. Similarly, the environmental crisis allows us to re-examine the heritage of a hundred years of socialism in a new light. The environmental crisis makes clear not only the need to overcome the division of town and country, but also the necessity of a third pole, that of wilderness, that undergirds the carbon cycle, quarantines zoonoses, and creates the basis for the socialist good life. The answer to the riddle of socialism is that it is a society guided by human consciousness that is simultaneously aware of the limits of the limits of such con consciousness and the dependence of humanity on a nature that is ultimately unknowable and self-willed. That society is half earth socialism. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for the uh, lecture. I mean, it has been a, a long panorama uh, to try and understand uh, the whole issue of all earth and uh, yeah but so it's been quite uh, inspiring and it's quite a lot of things to digest no because uh, literally you have bombarded us with uh, huge amounts of information and and ideas so hopefully uh, yeah there are questions and, 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 and comments about your, uh, your work. Uh, so perhaps I can start um, just asking uh, some questions that came to my mind by listening to your uh, overall lecture. And, and one question I have uh, is uh, regarding uh, the ownership of land, uh, which is in two uh, ways. One is uh, at least here in the UK, uh, kind of 50% of the land is owned by 1% of the population. And uh, obviously that's a, a huge kind of power struggle if we want to uh, unleash uh, such a project, no? like the one you may be, uh, or you're putting forward, no? like rewilding uh, huge parts of the land. Um, is there any precedent or ideas uh, from your side on how to uh, kind of struggle that power you know, that exists uh, in the ownership of land because one requires you know, uh, uh, access to, to, to land. You know? And at least in the UK, there's, there seems to be, you know, uh, or the, the government is uh, kind of uh, linked to, to those power elites that uh, organize uh, the land. And that happens, I guess, in many parts of the world. No? Um, so I don't know um, if you have any thoughts on that and how this can be uh, tackled, let's say, if, we, if one needs to go to towards that direction. And uh, the other thing is uh, indigenous practices, um, uh, which has to do also, I guess, with ownership. Uh, in some cases, uh, the issue of rewilding, um, uh, it's, uh, I think, maybe need to, to be more uh, defined, I guess, no? Uh, in the sense that, for example, one can see a lot of indigenous practices that perhaps can be within what you call rewilding, no? Uh, because they, they 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 work with nature rather than controlling nature, no? Uh, and so, and, and that mean also because, uh, as, as you mentioned, I think Toy mentioned at some point, no, there's projects of rewilding that literally are about, uh, you know, getting rid of you know the native population or the indigenous population i think no without even mentioning them uh, for the sake of uh, rewilding no so how does that uh, would work uh, in in your in your vision you know how how is that integrated because i many of these indigenous uh, practices perhaps they might have a different form of uh, economy no or different means of life no and uh, and perhaps they would benefit no uh, if there is a confederation of them that may be also having a, a voice, let's say, within that economic uh, or plan system, no? Um, so yeah, those those two are the things that if you have any thoughts on, on that. I'll just respond real quick. I'm sure you two can jump in. Uh, for the first question, I think I should have made it clear in my presentation that um, the half of socials proposal really can't coexist with 
capitalism, if only because it puts so many limits on accumulation. I mean, if you really say that half of the world is is off limits uh, to production, if you have to destroy the fossil fuel industry, you know, the real estate industry, the livestock industry, you're clearly you're going to make a lot of enemies. So, I mean, this it's really unlike the you know, pro nuclear greens or these other kind of acute, you know, fixes. This cannot coexist uh, with capitalism. And, and and I mean, there are other examples in history of revolutions occurring and then having large changes in, in land ownership and having real land reform. And I, it's been a while since I read up on the Cuban case, but I think it's a mix of um, some private land ownership amongst farmers and cooperatives and then the government owning a fair bit of land. So a mix, a mix and then uh, in similar, uh, and similar for urban agriculture. So I think it's, it's a mix of those. Um, but clearly you don't want to have like a tiny elite controlling all the land. You don't, you don't want that. Um, in terms of your second question, I mean, we completely agree that uh, Indigenous people should not be seen as enemies of uh, the conservation movement, and that has happened too often. And that is also a point of contention with a lot of animal liberationists. I personally, uh, I'm vegan and I believe in animal liberation, but I do see there's a difference with Indigenous practices uh, with, with, with wild animals. Um, and you know, there are plenty of studies to show that uh, indigenous managed areas actually are more biodiverse uh, than even uh, wildlife preserves. So clearly uh, they're doing something right. And um, and one can also add that they are very powerful allies. Uh, the environmental movement has only made any progress at all when they've allied with indigenous people. So, I mean, this has to be a very broad coalition uh, if this is going to have any traction at all. And uh, the indigenous people definitely have to be part of it. Thanks for the question. Uh, for the question, for the answer. Um, yeah. I, so the if you can, if if anyone wants to uh, ask a question, you can use the raise hand function uh, to ask the, the question. And uh, also, you can just place your question on the chat, and I can ask the question for you. Just before I jump to other questions, I just want to have a, your opinion on movements such as Degrow, uh, which seems to be something that maybe in line to what you're saying, you know, like it, it really is about, um, you know, uh, because this is a different paradigm, no? in which uh, if you want to make it work, then it means you have to consume uh, less. no, uh, And that's something that obviously uh, people, especially from the West, just go crazy and say that, well, you know, they're just getting rid or they want to get rid of our lifestyle and our freedoms. no, so. But I don't know, uh, well, uh, one thing is obviously, you know, the al alliances that one can create between, I don't know, let's say a half earth socialism and a degrowth movement. If you see that happening or if there's something that it might be compatible or there are kind of differences on that, no? Do you two want to jump in first? Yeah, I think, um, so I think, uh, Degrowth definitely has a lot in common with these ideas. And I think that, um, I definitely think that uh, the the people in the, the West who are like, oh, we need to protect our lifestyles or can't imagine like giving things up. Well, I think, uh, I think an important part of uh, a global environmental movement is international solidarity. And part of international solidarity means, uh, you know, as an American being like, we cannot <laughs> have this level of consumption and, simultaneously you know give everyone around the world access to you know the electricity and food that you know everyone needs for um for the kind of uh, society that we might we might dream of so yeah i think that there has to be the case made like the people in degrowth like a moral case and like a, a case like this for like you know being like this this sort of solidarity is necessary for building the sort of world we need i think that um uh, troy and philip will probably agree with me also that one of the things that about degrowth that we are a little skeptical of maybe is that it seems to lack sometimes, and not all degrowthers are like this, but sometimes lack a kind of sufficient political framing of it as um, maybe anti-capitalist or, uh, or as like fully acknowledging the consequences of degrowth or fully maybe coming to terms with what degrowth implies in terms of these systems so not going all the way. But I think that yeah, a lot. I, I don't know if Troy or Philip wants to jump in here, but I, I think that that that's probably our primary disagreement. But um, but I, I I personally think that degrowth is doing great work in making these moral cases for the West slowing down yeah. its consumption. 
I, I would agree. I'm not very well read on degrowth, but I, I think that um, like if you ask what growth is and then what is growth within a capitalist society, then it's clearly it's clear that it's a necessity of the system um, and that you cannot have both, you know, capitalist social relations and degrowth because they are inherently contradiction uh, contradictory. So I think, you know, I think there's a kind of lack of trying to imagine um, that, you know, you have to get rid of one or the other, uh, let's say. And I think, um, I think Walter Benjamin, for example, is a good thinker who has, you know, questioned progress um, in the face of capitalist development, right? Um, and I think uh, that's a quite a succinct critique of some of the degrowth tendencies. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with that. So let's we'll leave that there then. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, I have my question, but I'm gonna read some of the ones in the chat. Uh, uh, so there is one from Lucy Reed, I think. Uh, Thank you for your fascinating and inspiring talk. You have given us much to digest. I am interested to hear more about how the three of you from different disciplines met, were put in touch, or how you evolved this important project. And her question links to the idea of the changing expertise needed for, say, an architectural project going forward? Well, I wrote my article uh, that, you know, the kind of the first version of this, this argument in 2018. And then uh, both Drew and Philip wrote to me afterwards to say that they liked it and they were interested in collaborating in some way. Um, and that we just got to know each other and that's basically it. But I mean, it's it's been really fun and rewarding to do interdisciplinary work. And uh, like I couldn't do this kind of stuff on my own, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and it's been interesting to also like, write together. But it hasn't been, I think, I don't know if you would dis you two would disagree, but like, as challenging as I feared in some ways in terms of finding a common language, um, it hasn't been too, too painful. Uh, it's, and, and again, it's been be helpful. And again, if more people are interested in uh, in this project and want to reach out to us, you know, we're we're all ears. I mean, we need more disciplines, if anything. Um, yep. Yeah, we we might need a um, a a jurist now that you post the question of ownership, right? <laughs> Maybe an ecologist. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's the open call for disciplines to join. Uh, Great. Uh, uh, there's a question about ice that uh, a guy called Ryan Darius wants to ask. Uh, so he's going to ask to unmute. And Ryan, you can. Uh, hi. Go oh, yeah. It. So am I disabled? Can I speak or should I? Type? Yeah, you can. OK, hi. Uh, great lecture. I mean, it's really inspiring. And thank you for that. Uh, the question of land and like read by these three different perspectives and the relationship to the environmental crisis. But uh, for me personally, there is one part of the lecture which really intrigues me. I mean, this may be like out of context, but I'm especially intrigued by the, the idea of ice as a land that is depleting. I mean, it's not explicitly touched on, on the lecture, but it has been alluded like several times because there was this slide about the fetishization of the little ice age, which enables the enables this uh, frost fair in the Thames, London. And there is this route to life, which is the German supply lines, which is literally like trading over the frozen lakes. And also there's this methane bubble formation on the frozen lake in Baikal. So I'm wondering what's the importance of ice in our current social economic context. I mean, if we see ice as a land itself, it's fragile, it's depleting and it's ever changing somehow it's worthless. If we talk about the land ownership, no one actually owns a land made of ice. And especially when we have this ambition of the global geoengineering, reducing carbon and like sustainable energy supply that wants to bring down the global earth temperature, aren't we just like creating more ice? So yeah, uh, I'm just wondering, can you guys talk a little bit more about ice? It's really fascinating. <laughs> I, I can maybe start with this one because uh, I think one thing that is really interesting in recent uh, politics is that um, 
the Arctic in that it's having basically very low ice summers um, and like the ice is thinner year round that you're actually able to have like uh, tanker ships and uh, carrier ships go through the Arctic, uh, which uh, with like uh, icebreaker ships, which has not been able to happen before. So commerce has opened up new trade routes over the North, uh, which is uh, cut down shipping times. Um, so, uh, and this in fact can do things like better link, you know, Russian oil and gas industry to the global economy and all these things. So, so ice is a huge part of global political economy. Um, in fact, like a lot of uh, oil and gas extraction in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, very northern Alaska, there are all these stories you hear about when the permafrost is melting, these, these roads are buckling under the changing landscape because of the changing ice. So you actually uh, build these buildings in Prudhoe Bay, these oil and gas for, uh, extraction things with foundation that has refrigerants wrapping all the way around it to keep the land frozen around these things. So you freeze the land so you can build these gigantic fossil fuel infrastructures. So land is a huge, so ice is a huge deal in terms of especially fossil fuel industry. Uh, and ironically, as it melts, you know, you're, you're, changing the physics of the world, you're reflecting less light back to the, to the, uh, you're reflecting less light back to the space. So you get this feedback where you increase climate change, but you also increase the ability of oil and gas to come to the market and you, and, but you also maybe change the Prudhoe Bay thing. So it, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I'm sure that there is a lot of work that could be done to think about what, <laughs> what ice means, but it's, uh, it's definitely not just this like passive thing. It, it is a real, a real change. Yeah. I, don't know if I, I, I never that. thought of uh, those connections before. It's it's quite nice, um, and I would say yeah, I think you're right. The same analysis that looks at biodiversity and land area uh, would apply to the to the Arctic ice. I mean, we, there's obviously a lot less. And that's been a huge problem for you know, polar bears, uh, for instance. They're, they're not doing well because they have just less. It's, it's, it's like their habitat has been destroyed as if it were land. So I think that's a good approach. So thanks for that. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to jump to Constant Victory, uh, who says that, do you believe that C Cuba's radical sustain model would work for large countries like the US, or would it be more successful uh, with island nations and municipalities? Who wants to jump in? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if it, I mean, I think that, that being an island has helped it survive an embargo or invasion and whatnot. But uh, if the world were to go socialist, I don't think it would need to be uh, an islands first or anything like that. So I'm not really sure. I don't know what you two think about that. I think the US could be socialist. There's no reason why it can't be socialist. It's just uh, obviously a lot of people don't want that, especially powerful people. I, uh, I think our point, yeah, Philip, you wanna jump in here? I just want to say very quickly, I think maybe the island or, you know, mainland question is, is less important than the, uh, like, the fer how fertile the region is. I mean, one major um, aspect of this kind of turn to the kind of agricultural, let's call it a determinate negation of capitalism, is um, that, you know, in order to protect yourself from any sort of counter-revolutionary project, you would need uh, to feed yourself, basically. I think it's a very kind of almost banal problem. And I think um, that makes it, um, I think that question is a bit more interesting than, you know, the, the, the island mainland uh, dichotomy, because I don't really see directly that there should be a major uh, change in the premises on that, Drew. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have that much to add to this other than I think our point with Cuba is that it's almost sort of the as when you get rid of fossil fuels, there are certain sorts of processes uh, based on just the physical amount of labor that needs to go into kind of uh, farming without the help of fossil fuels that kind of pushes this town country distinction. Um, it kind of starts to collapse that distinction. It's almost like a uh, a process that's um, maybe not even intentional. Um, but so, and I think that that is that would probably be universal. I don't think that's any dependency on the fact that it's an island, but that's all I really have to add. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a one from Matthew Collado, uh, who said that, how would the vision for a half earth socialism attempt to deal with the current reality of the nation state form? Um, such a proposal would seem to assume transcending it. 
but against an insurgent trend of nationalism from Modi to Xi to Bolsonaro, what kind of internationalist politics would have to undergird the project? Uh, I mean, socialism is an internationalist creed, and I think that can that can be forgotten uh, in recent years. And there have been, you know, movements like Aufstehen in Germany where they try to appeal to this nationalist, um, you know, moment, which I think is a mistake. Uh, you know, the the model that we're talking about is interesting because it becomes more efficient. Um, the larger the, the scale is, right? So it's better to have a, a single um, planning model rather than many small models. Um, and I get my, the way I see it, again, I'm not really an optimist. It may sound like we're optimistic. I, I'm not, I think this could be a possible way to solve the crisis. I don't think it's necessarily likely. Uh, far from that. And there aren't very many vegan Marxists around, <laughs> for instance. Um, but uh, the way I would see it is there would be some perhaps national revolutions that would link up uh, eventually, and then begin to coordinate amongst themselves. We even have like, a fictional aspect at the end of the book where we talk about uh, Cuba having like the planetary uh, planning headquarters, for instance. I think also uh, uh, one aspect of that is, um, I mean, uh, I agree with Troy and everything about the kind of uh, the anti-national uh, creed that socialism is, but I think even on a kind of, if you can reduce it to an, an, a like purely technical problem, I think like keeping borders uh, makes rewilding very, very difficult because um, let's say that, I mean, of course, rewilding half the earth would not be that you have half the globe and then you draw like one straight line, a half is wilderness and half is not. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of um, uh, multifaceted problem that exists on many scales simultaneously. And if you, if you take every nation on earth and you divide them in half and do the same, then of course it's going to be different, you know, if you have a large nation or a small nation, or if you have a nation in a certain climate or a nation in another climate. So national borders really, really, uh, like on a technical level, even, uh, really make it more of a difficult project. So for that reason alone, I think it's worth, um, uh, transcending. Yeah. Perfect. Um, thank you very much yeah. for that. I, I don't know if you want to add more. I'll, I'll just add that, like, I think to Troy's point that, like, you know, we're not necessarily optimistic. I think that maybe one thing to make of this is that it maybe outlines directions that are productive to go. And I think that one, once we think about all these issues that we talked about here, the need to make the case for internationalism and for international solidarity, and international support, I think should be clear. So even if this doesn't happen, you know, or whatever, like, I think that, you know, making the case that we we owe something to people in other countries and you know maybe this nation state thing doesn't really work anymore like that is a case that we i think need to make yeah okay thanks uh, we have dean uh, go and john goodpon so we'll go in that order uh, so dean uh let me just we cannot mute your All right. thanks for a great uh a great talk guys um I just wanted to say, I mean, you ended up somewhere that seemed to me to be quite convincing, which is um, the model of Cuba. Um, that kind of seems that kind of seems to work, but I, I'm a bit unclear about where the um, the cybernetics fits in here. I mean, you you seem to be saying, well, Stafford Beer was right, uh, and Hayek, you know, with his catalexy that's impossible to control, his you know his idea of the economy that is too complex. Uh, for us to uh, manage or control, uh, I was kind of wrong. Um, and uh, firstly, I'm not sure that you've shown that that's the case. Okay, the economy may be less complex than uh, nature, but it involves things like human desire, which you haven't really talked about very much. Um, uh, but secondly, even if it is the case, then how does that kind of cybernetic uh, revolution or co-revolution lead us to necessarily to Cuba uh, and why is it even necessary if, if Cuba occurred just by simply kind of ruling out fossil fuels then why do we need the complexity of, of, of a kind of control system that clearly uh, half the world the libertarian half is going to be kind of really rather worried about I was talking about neoliberalism but Drew why don't you take the question about cybernetics yeah well it's a it's a good point and actually this is one of the um the 
I guess maybe this is Marx has a thing about not making a rule, cook shop for the future. You don't want to be making, you know, recipes for the future, you know, without uh, fighting for it. We, we kind of push back against and we think we, we think that it's actually useful to go through this sort of utopian exercise and like how, thinking through in detail, like how all these things might work. But it's, it's an interesting point that Cuba was able to do maybe what we, we envision without any complicated planning apparatus. Um, I think our point is not so much that like, if you don't do it our way, then it will never work. And that's definitely not, that's just not even true. But I think that um, what our exercise with thinking through the, the idea of like control system, optimize, optimizing systems is the, the dream would be to create like some sort of uh, global system which, and we we go into a lot more detail in the book about this, but some sort of global kind of computerized system where you would have a way of kind of producing plans where you might say over the next X number of years, these are some goals that we might have, and this is might be how they would look like in practice. And then, you know, you might have some way of working those out. And then you would have some sort of like system that would, uh, and again, we go into more detail in the book where like, you know, as things are changing over time, we're kind of updating the terms of the system and this can kind of help, you know, as, you know, an urban planner and, you know, Boston, you know, trying to go about making your city more green, you can kind of take into account changes all over the world, uh, you know, different needs and things and kind of update those plans accordingly. So, yeah, I guess it's um, not strictly necessary maybe, uh, uh, but I think that, uh, it helps you maybe be more efficient, more smart, uh, you know, make sure that you're respecting all these planetary boundaries, make sure that, you know, as I'm doing these things in Boston, I'm not consuming too much. And therefore, you know, uh, we're passing a planetary boundaries and I'm not even aware of it because my actions on their own aren't going to push this planetary boundary aside, but us all together will. So there's this sort of idea of like kind of this global knowledge network, sort of like a meteorological global knowledge network helps us all, you know, be smarter about, our decisions, if that makes sense. I don't know if that fully answers your question. I would, say, Troy, I would say also that, you know, Kantorovich, well, first of all, like command and control planning is not very efficient, right? And uh, Kantorovich estimated that using optimization, they can increase the efficiency of the Soviet economy by 30 to 50%, right? So my guess is uh, probably the Cuban economy could also benefit from these kind of uh, tools. Um, and I suppose it's it's also these are useful tools when you get to more like, complex and larger systems. Like planning the world system through like God's plan would be very difficult, probably, and not very efficient at all. So that's, that's one thing. In terms of the neoliberal question, um, and what's interesting about Hayek is that he really draws on biology for his metaphors, and he wants to say that the economy is uh, unknowable like nature, right? Uh, in a way that economists generally, I mean, neoclassical economists, they drew on physics and they want to say, I think especially like Newtonian physics, 19th century physics, and say that uh, the economy was knowable, which is why they had, they just assumed total uh, knowledge to make their models work. But Hayek um, can drew from, from biology instead. And, I, and we want to get down to this choice where um, when you're confronted with certain problems like geoengineering, for instance, you have to choose, like, is nature more unknowable than the economy? And if you choose, uh, if you say that the economy is more unknowable, then you're going to lead, you're going to make certain choices such as geoengineering, and then you're going to cause certain environmental disasters. Uh, and we can kind of see how this is going to play out, right? With a fully commodified nature. Uh, and we just are saying we should make a choice uh, against that if we want to stop the environmental crisis because it has to be limited and controlled. I mean, the point of socialism is that it's not necessarily or inherently environmental at all. Like most most socialists are not, I and mean, obviously the socialist heritage is pretty bleak uh, in terms of the environment. But be, a conscious control of the economy offers the possibility of uh, a real uh, environmental policy, I would say. Uh, but it has to be consciously decided. I mean, this is the, the democratic uh, aspect as in we have to decide amongst ourselves how we want to relate to nature and to each other uh, in a way that we can't decide all these things in capitalism. Right. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna go for one last question from John. And because, yeah, okay. John, do you want to unmute yourself or? I need to right. okay can you hear me okay now yeah yeah great um no, thank you for that and i share a great many of your points of inspiration um 
I had a, a, yeah, some questions or points which actually follow on from, from the very recent points just made. So I guess I'm curious, partly actually um, in, in this idea of, of having these, these well divided into, and I know you're not literally meaning that, but um, I think there's, there is something useful in holding that in brackets, as it were. But, the, but there's a very interesting call from... Um, uh, uh, it actually came from the Zapatistas originally, I think, of, of, of South American indigenous cultures of, 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 of actually calling for a many worlds approach rather than a, a, a divining worlds approach. And I wonder if we can hold those two things in, in parallel, actually, for a moment, because there's actually, if I now branch off to, to approach this question via cybernetics that there's actually two very different traditions in cybernetics right there's one which is about control but there's actually one which is all about non-control actually it's, it's actually about observation and dealing with the fact how to manage in a condition where we can't control that condition um, how to deal with the with if you like the, the the difficulties of planning and conscious purpose so I'm thinking part, very much actually of, of Stafford Beer's tradition and, and people like Gregory Bateson actually in particular as well. And so I was kind of thinking, well, with this bicameral idea of, okay, we have world culture and we'll try to allow a certain kind of rewilding, but we'd need to remember that rewilding is itself a certain kind of management project. You know, it's, 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 it's not something I'm going to say. What does that bicameral condition allow? Um, and I'm then starting to think to some of Stafford Beer's other experiments, his biological computing experiments. And, and so interestingly, you, you started to move in that direction a moment ago, where he was looking at things like, you know, tying factories up with ponds and, and, and in general, looking at how can we not even try to plan things in the way in which we've inherited certain ideas about planning, but just how can we play with complexity more? but in a way where we might actually expand our ideas of what consciousness and, and planning are to become more ecological conditions in, in some of the ways in which the, the more speculative and radical wing of cybernetics, I think, try to. So, yeah, I very much appreciate your, your taking us in this direction. And, and I'd, um, yeah, it's, it's a very open question there. Drew, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can I can start and maybe you guys can fill in. I, it's a very interesting question. I think for me, one of the ways that I've thought about rewilding, I guess maybe in this more, uh, maybe this cybernetic vision or like this model vision is like, you know, maybe the half earth that's the town country part of Philip's thing is is part of this maybe earth system model cybernetic C linear programming thing. And that's part of indie. Maybe you might even call it like the idea of like human influence space or like, you know, civilizational space or whatever you want to call it. And then that's sort of planned on one logic, you know, the logic that we've sort of spent most of the time talking about, but we've not talked about the rewilding half and that that might make more sense to be like, um, we talk about this a little bit in the fictional chapter in the book, how this might look, but you, you could have like all sorts of different ideas of this and th th this would be governed by its own separate logic which might not be in this computerized network vision of it because it's sort of a different logic and you might have things like um you know indigenous management mixed with you know like maybe you know you sort of western style ecology in different places you know there's all sorts of different ideas that you could envision this uh, envision this happening and this sort of indigenous management is you know something that happens now like these ideas are already here and that's sort of one thing that we've been pushing at here so these ideas are here um um i don't know i, I philip troy do you want to jump in here at, at all and i just say um i'm not an expert in cybernetics um so I, I would appreciate if you have some good uh, recommendations. I mean, I've been relying mainly on Drew's expertise uh, in this regard. But yeah, please, please send that, please send that along. I would say I read more beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it pretty cool. But um, I would say I, part of me is somewhat skeptical in some ways, like just because when it's including natural systems within uh, a network, that doesn't mean it is by itself ecological. I mean, there's a really great book by Ken Fish on living factories and this idea that 
uh, what capitalism is, is a system that wants to redirect natural flows towards the ends of accumulation. And it's not the factory that's the ideal capitalist system. And so like the, the end point of capitalism is really the genetically modified organism where it's directly using the metabolism of a living thing towards uh, making commodities, right? Like making a spider silk from a goat or whatever it is. So, I mean, um, I, I would say that, I'm not saying that beer is necessarily like that, but just to have a, um, be aware of that, I suppose. Uh, and I mean, in some ways we're including obviously nature within our, our models as in we're thinking about how much carbon are we sequestering and all that. But the idea that we stress the unknowability of nature is that there's always, um, we depend on it in ways we do not understand and we cannot replicate its, uh, uh, its services. Um, and therefore we have to have, you give this the space for it and make sure that it is functioning. Um, if that makes any sense. But yeah, please please send along if you want to chat more, we'd be happy to do that. And that sounds really good. Well, perfect. Uh, I think we kind of gonna close here because uh, this is, uh, it's been longer than, than usual, but it was uh, as everybody mentioned in the chat and we can send you the chat with the comments. Uh, it's been, uh, a great lecture and very inspiring, no? uh, especially for, uh, I think, for architects, as Philip uh, shown, uh, shown in, in, the, in the lecture, uh, we need a, a lot more imagination from the profession uh, to really em envisage a, a utopian uh, kind of future, no? if we want to embrace some of these ideas, because obviously, uh, at least from the examples that Philip showed, it doesn't look like, you know, uh, it's doing it's doing well, so so perhaps it's uh, it's something that uh, we all need to to work towards, no? Um, so I think that's a challenge that Philip put to all of us here at the AA and I guess in general as a profession. But yeah, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. It's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, the lecture will be online sometime soon. Hopefully that can be shared with more audience. And yeah, we'll keep in touch. Um, bye for now. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye.